All right, so I've uh, started to populate the Canvas site with um, the, uh, the assignments that are coming up as well as the kind of bigger assignments, uh, just stubs, uh, just to get them on the calendar. So um, as I keep moving, then uh, those assignments are gonna populate it and the Canvas calendar will get filled in. So um, all of those uh, rough due dates that I've put into that uh, PDF, that's under course information will be reflected in that calendar. So that'll be there. Um, other sort of reminders, um, there's uh, so uh, assignments like this weekend, there's that muddiest point discussion. So at 1.15 today, that'll get uh, released. And you can find it under uh, the muddiest points module or under discussions that just say muddiest point week 01. So again, with that one, you just post three short uh, discussion posts uh, where you say, what was you thought the uh, most difficult uh, concept from this week uh, or, or a question you have about concept from this week? Uh, what was the most interesting or most relevant to sustainability uh, concept from this week, a second post? And then your third post is, you may have to wait you know, for a little bit for post to populate, but then uh, is to respond to another student's post and, and add something that is uh, constructive more than just an agreement. So maybe you answer a question, maybe you add a new question, maybe you do a follow-up. Um, a lot of, um, I said a lot of great discussion on perusal uh, last night, uh, and I really appreciate all of that sort of effort. Um, just something along those lines where somebody said something interesting and you sort of say, hey, that got me thinking this way, or that made me think of this question. Uh, and then I'll go through and, um, and then give everybody the, uh, the credit for that. So it should be a pretty easy assignment. Um, and uh, the other uh, thing is that uh, the next reading will be, I think, a week from today. So on Tuesday, uh, we're going to be talking more about causal loop diagrams and making sure we feel comfortable being able to draw them and all the rules for drawing them. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. And then on Thursday, we'll start with the first reading um, of the next uh, unit. So, um, so that's the next thing to look out for there. So, all right, um, with that, uh, any questions about administrative things? Yeah. That's a good question. So in perusal, um, perusal's got its own grade book that you should have access to that gets synced to Canvas. Sometimes it takes a few hours to sync. Sometimes it's relatively instantaneous. The perusal grade book will eventually get synced to Canvas, and the max grade you can get is three. So um, perusal has a sort of interesting calculation um, where uh, you know I, I don't have the exact numbers here, but um, but basically it says like you get uh, you you need to score a hundred percent to get three points, but to get that a hundred percent, there's different contributions. So. Um, and I, again, I don't know what the numbers are, but it's like, let's say you get 50% for, uh, you know, reading all the way. So reading 100% um, of the article. And then you might get another 25% uh, for returning to the article. Or you might get um, another 5% uh, for each comment um, and so on. And so, if you were to do everything you could possibly do on perusal, it's possible to get like 600%. Um, and it's about a caps it at 100. So basically what you could do is, you know, you read the whole thing, um, you could add a couple of comments, and then if you go to the gradebook and you got a three, you're done. So um, it's, uh, so I can't give you like the formula perusal uses. The, uh, there's also like, when you post a comment, perusal will score it with either a zero, one or a two. So if you just like, said, uh, this is interesting, Perusals has artificial intelligence that will map that to a zero. And, uh, but if you say like add something to it, then it might map it to a one or a two. And so different um, strength comments give you different percentages as well. So um, maybe a, a couple of uh, minor comments will be enough or one major comment would be enough. So any other questions? All right, yeah. Uh, the, you'll, the, you can always, that reading is, is available um, on the Canvas webpage as a raw PDF. So you can get it there. 
Um, I think you can, I don't know for sure this, I've never tried this. I think you can go back to perusal and get the reading. You just can't add more comments. Okay. Any other questions? All right, great. So, um, you know, so I've got a couple of things I want to make sure we hit during this discussion, uh, but um, along, but um, before that, I mean, are there just generally any uh, reflections about the article? Any, um, anything that you thought was particularly notable? Any questions? No, all right. So, you know, the article starts out with what is a system? So what is a system? So how, um, roughly speaking, how did the article make the, the, the argument for a definition of a system as opposed to a collection? What's the difference between a system and a collection? This will be system versus collection. Yeah. I like the interworking parts. I'll write that down. What do you mean by that? Like, what's the difference between something with interworking parts and without? All right, so that's an interesting uh, way to say it. So you say that a uh, system has a goal, but a collection does not. That's a, that's a really interesting distinction. And, and, and I think you know, that kind of makes me think of something else that I think came up in the perusal comments. They mentioned that um, a collection, one example of a collection was a kitchen, but a system was a kitchen with a person, a human, using it. So why does a kitchen suddenly become a system when there's a person in it? Have we any thoughts about that? Yeah. So the comment there was that uh, the person has purpose. I like that. Any other comments or thoughts? Yeah. Person, uh, I'll say, brings or uses parts together. I like that too. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's a great point to make on the side here is that systems can have subsystems or we can have systems of systems. So, um, so th and this came up in the perusal too. Like they said, a toaster is a system, but a toaster is in a kitchen. And they said a kitchen wasn't a system. And you say, well, does, isn't a kitchen, doesn't a kitchen inherit a system this from its, its toaster? But that's kind of the beauty of a system. Once something is a system, it sort of becomes monolithic. We sort of stop thinking about its parts and we start thinking about it as a whole. A toaster has a lot of parts, but we don't ever think about the parts of a toaster. But we do think about all the individual things in a kitchen. There's all these spoons, there's all these knives, there's a toaster, there's a blender. A blender has parts. Uh, there's an oven, an oven has parts. Uh, but we don't think about those parts. We think about the whole. That part whole distinction at the instant where it becomes a shared purpose is when we have a system. And that's what I thought, I thought it was a really clever thing where they talked about once you put a person in the kitchen, because you go into the kitchen and you're like, I'm hungry, I wanna make lunch. What can I make? The different, suddenly the different kitchens you're in will affect how you make the lunch. So a kitchen by itself without lunch as a driver um, doesn't have any interrelationship between the parts. But suddenly you walk into a kitchen that has a hot plate um, and uh, you know maybe some utensils 
um, maybe a mini fridge, you'll make a very different lunch than a kitchen you walk into that has like a microwave, uh, you know, stove and, and maybe a lot more tools. So you're driven by the same goals, but the, but the kitchen constrains the activity. And it's those constraints, those interrelationships that end up making um, systems more than just collections. And, um, and that's why I also like this bowl of fruit example. So um, let's maybe write that up here. So what was the deal with the bowl of fruit? So we might think of a bowl of fruit as a collection, um, but there was a claim that actually, especially to uh, someone who studies fruit or studies plants, it, it itself is a system. How is a bowl of fruit a system and not just a collection of fruit. Yeah. So the fruit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, I like that. So the fruit decay is different depending on what fruit is there or are there, I guess. Any other comments about the fruit bowl? So what I like to say um, is that there is a synergistic as opposed to additive interaction. So, um, so I, I say this is a synergistic interaction instead of additive. So what do I mean by that? Well, you know, my further term synergy means that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And so an additive, like if it were the case that an apple decayed the same way in the presence of other apples as it did alone. So you can measure like how long until the apple turns a particular color. And that might be, you know, five weeks alone. And if it was, five weeks when it's surrounded by other apples, then I would say that there's just an additive combination. So if you put a bunch of fruit next to each other and they all act the same way they do alone, then we're just adding their behaviors together. There's nothing special going on between them. But a synergistic interaction is when the apple is next to the other apple and maybe it's releasing volatile compounds into the air and those are affecting the decay rate of the other apple. And that's going to release volatile compounds in the air, which will affect the decay rate of the original apple that we started talking about. And now instead of decaying in five weeks, they both decay in four weeks or three weeks. And so they could never decay in three weeks on their own, but um, together they can do something that each individual couldn't do by themselves. So that's what I mean by it's, it's synergistic. So in the apple case, there was like volatile compounds, so volatile chemicals uh, link the apple's behavior or the, yeah, I'll say the apple, yeah. But in general, it doesn't have to be something chemical or physical, it could be informational. Uh, there is a, uh, a former graduate student of ASU is now a, faculty member elsewhere who um, studied uh, um, this fanning behavior in honeybees. And so um, a honeybee will stand outside at the entrance of a hive. And when the hive gets hot, she can flap her wings to create airflow go, um, to, to, to cool the hive. And you can put a honeybee in a lab uh, and you can crank up the temperature on that individual honeybee and see when she starts flapping her wings to fan. And it turns out that she will flap her wings to fan reliably at one temperature when she's alone, but reliably at a different temperature when she's with others. And so we don't know what the interaction is. Maybe she can smell the others or whatever, but the point is the information that she is around other honeybees changes her response. And that's what makes it another one of these things that's synergistic 
or not just additive. If there were a bunch of them and they all flap their wings at the same temperature, regardless of how many bees were around, then it just would be an additive effect. But it's uh, a synergistic effect is, you know, they're changing. Um, another example, sometimes synergy is bad. So uh, I um, am working on a contract now with the government where we put together systems that, uh, you know, a, a uh, a high level, um, it's someone at a very high level, let's say uh, if we're talking about a first responder, you know, there's a there's sort of a catastrophe in a city and there's somebody at a high level says, we need a bunch of uh, autonomous agents to go and search these buildings for survivors. And so they give some a high level goal and <clears throat> we have a bunch of low level behaviors that each one of these autonomous agents knows how to do as a group. Um, but sometimes to achieve the high level goal, we have to combine those together. And in that case, um, those combinations might say, okay, so now you'll know how to search for people and how to move around obstacles. Um, and we want those two abilities to add so that we can say, you search for people and you won't hit any obstacles. But we don't want any synergy between those two tasks because we don't want a third behavior that we haven't planned for to suddenly emerge um, as a consequence of these two types of behaviors interacting. So, um, you know, maybe somehow, um, even though they never do, um, you know, maybe they never crash and burn into the ground when uh, for either one of those, when you mix them together, for some reason they start crashing. And that would be a synergistic interaction between those two different tasks. So sometimes you want additives because you don't want interactions because they create things you didn't know, you know, didn't plan for. But in reality, in nature, a whole lot of natural systems have these interconnections, and it's hard to sort of find those things. Um, so, you know, and that create that actually was spoken to a little bit in the article too. So, anyways, before we move on, so any questions about that? What I mean by synergistic and additive systems and collections? Were there any other examples that you thought were particularly salient or important that were brought up in the article? As you listed about a whole bunch, like a marriage was probably a system. Um, hopefully, a healthy marriage is a system. But if two people who are married are pretty much just roommates, then maybe they're more of a collection, and that's kind of an unhealthy marriage. Um, you know, those sorts of things. A car. Um, I thought a, a car was a good example where um, I guess I should maybe mention that too. So a, a vehicle. Given we did the kitchen example, you might think a vehicle alone. Um, is a collection and a vehicle with a human is a system. But I would say a vehicle is always a system. And that's because it is a very non random collection, I'll say a non random collection of uh, components. So, what I mean by that is uh, if you reordered them, it would cease to be a car. So if we think about a kitchen, it really doesn't matter where the spoons are. They could be in one drawer or another, it's still a kitchen. But in a car, it really matters that the tires are in a particular spot on the car. Um, someone brought up in the perusal, a salad example, like if you crafted or any, really any prepared dish, um, if you crafted a prepared dish, like this is lasagna. You know, lasagna, regardless of where it's being, how it's being eaten, has a particular structure. It is non-random. It's not just a random collection of noodles and whatever just thrown on a plate. If you, um, if you scrambled it up in a different way, it would not be lasagna anymore. And so constraints often generate interactions and interactions um, generate systems. Constraints generate interactions, and interactions can lead to systems. So any questions about that? Is it clear that a vehicle, even an empty vehicle, we still view as a system um, just because it's, it's not just a collection of vehicle parts? If I take the vehicle apart, I put it in drawers in a garage, it ceases to be a system. But when I assemble them for a purpose, like there's it, it, that the car really needs these things to be in this particular space, 
then that implies that it must be a system because if I take a wheel away, in order for it to remain a car, I got to put another wheel back. So that constraint generates an interdependency where the other components need each other to maintain their identity as a system. Okay. Okay. All right, so uh, we often talk about natural systems. Especially in ecology. So what do you think that, and this wasn't really talked about specifically, they, they kind of hinted at this, but what's the difference between like, what is, why do we use the word natural? Um, you know, like, why do we just say systems? What's special about natural systems? as opposed to like a vehicle, a car. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah, I'll say not, uh, not uh, man-made, naturally occurring. Any other thoughts? Yeah. So it uh, has sort of a, a long um, natural sort of design history or something like that. I saw several more hands, yeah. Purpose is hard to define. I like that and we'll come back to that for sure. Other comments, yeah. Yeah, so without, I'll say without a uh, forcing influence, I guess, or, a, you know, it's, um, it's, and where this I'm referring to like is a uh, human force. Yeah, all those are great. Yeah, I see a natural, what, what the reason we use the natural systems, we talk about natural systems, is that these interdependencies can self-organized can occur naturally. Um, and so when we often talk about systems like vehicles um, or even bowls of fruit, putting the fruit together, uh, we often think about things that we've done purposely as uh, interveners, as designers, as, as humans that have built these things. You know, we built this room um, in order to deliver uh, particular types of information. Um, we built this computer, we built a tablet, uh, but uh, we have to realize that the same sorts of interdependencies just naturally occur. Uh, you know, things like, kind of like a bowl of fruit actually, is that, that uh, when you put these things together, then they just can start interacting. You know, um, honeybees, the fanning behavior, uh, and this goes to the comment where it's the purpose is hard to define. Um, it wasn't known until Chelsea Cook put them in, uh, you know, started to do the experiment that honeybees start flapping their wings at different temperatures when they're in a social setting. It just wasn't known. You know, we didn't know that a group of honeybees fanning together was a fanning system and not just a group of honeybees individually trying to cool the colony. Um, and so, so those, uh, that's the really tricky thing about natural systems is that we often have to experiment with them to even figure out if they're a system. We have to perturb them. We have to come up with a hypothesis that, and then try to test that hypothesis. And that might involve like, well, we think that this particular component, that this tree is critical to the health of this particular um, habitat. Well, the only way we're gonna know that's true is if we take the tree out and see if everything else you know, declines or what happens. You know, so, uh, so those are some of the things that it's tricky about natural systems is that uh, we often have to experiment even to figure out what the system is. Um, and so consequently, this makes it hard for our decision-making because we might assume that one particular fish that's in the Colorado River um, that maybe is facing uh, hard times because of hydroelectric practices somewhere else in the Colorado River, 
uh, we might assume that, well, it's, it's just one fish. It doesn't really have, uh, it doesn't appear to be important to a much larger set of organisms other than itself. But because we can't see the system, we don't know what might happen. And we might find out that after you get rid of that fish, that um, a whole bunch of other things depended on that fish that we just never observed those interactions. Similar for like, you know, we now have molecular methods that allow us to create mosquitoes that if released could um, drive a, a great deal of mosquitoes in an area pretty much to sterility and then eradication. But a lot of things eat mosquitoes. You know, the mosquitoes are, do have, I don't wanna say mosquitoes have function, but mosquitoes are a component in a system that has function. And I, by the way, I used to like to use the term function over purpose. And so we don't know what is a cog in the machine. We don't even know what the machine is sometimes, but even when we know that a machine exists, we don't know what all its cogs are. And that's what makes natural systems so complex to deal with as opposed to like a kitchen that we pretty much know how they all work together. Um, or a watch, we pretty much know how every component in a watch, um, as complicated as it is, fits into the global picture of how the watch works. But we don't really know um, everything that's necessary for a forest to thrive or a forest to thrive for a hundred years over 20 years and so on and so forth. All right, so any comments about that or questions about that idea is that natural systems or I guess I'm going to, I just will add the word cryptic. And that makes them tricky. Okay, good. All right, so, um, Okay, so there's also a lot of focus, once we got this kind of definition of systems, um, they kind of backed up and thought about motivations. And uh, the author sort of started talking about this event-oriented worldview uh, versus a feedback loop worldview. And these terms were introduced, events, patterns, and systemic structures. So any, um, so any comments on these things? What, what is, what's the difference between these things? Like what is an event and um, and how is, why is it important for us to think about events versus patterns versus systemic structures? What was the point of this whole section? Yeah, I had this like iceberg, I think they talked about. Um, yeah, and so like we had events up top and then patterns and um, systemic structures and um, called it the iceberg. And any thoughts about why he called it the iceberg and how it relates to this whole picture? Yeah, I like the analogy. This tip of the iceberg are the events. So the events here are just the tip of the iceberg. So, I mean, so I think what we're sort of saying here is that the events, these are the things we observe. And so those are the things we're most likely going to want to respond to. So, um, so an event-oriented worldview um, is one in which we, um, you know, we want to react to individual events. And I like there is a comment in the in the uh, uh, in the perusal about systemic racism is uh, you know another invocation of this word systemic structure or systemic, and you can think about there are individual events of racism which are very observable, and one the event oriented worldview 
from a management perspective or whatever would to say, um, okay, if you witness an event, an act of racism, then here's a form to fill out, um, submit it, and then we will sanction whoever is involved after an investigation, and we will solve that event. Um, and that would be the event-oriented worldview. We're focusing on individual events. We're going to react to them. We're going to resolve the event, and then we're going to move on. So then they talk about patterns here. You can imagine that um, if you do that enough, you can keep a record of it. And this is sort of like a record of many events. You know, a pattern is a non-random um, occurrence of events. You might notice that, huh, in this institution, you see a lot more events of, you know, particular events. Um, you know, racism is one particular example. We can come up with a lot of other different events. But if you kept a record of it, you could say, oh, this institution, there's a lot of those. And this other institution that there's, there's not. Well, if you just recognize the pattern of events, then again, kind of the event-oriented worldview, um, although it's getting a little more mature, I suppose, is that you could say, well, we could adapt. So to um, so use this term, you can adapt. So this is react is for events, and then uh, you can adapt. And what adapt means is you got to live with it. So you can you can just sort of say uh, adjust to accommodate the pattern. So I'm not actually fixing the pattern, but we're just saying that oh yeah. Um, on this particular football team or in this particular sport or this particular organization, they have a history of that. So if you're going to work at that organization, then you need to equip yourself for this particular pattern. And at least we're acknowledging that that pattern is there um, and then hopefully helping to someone to be able to cope with that. But then you could say, well, um, you know, if we go further, we can say, what well, yeah, can we really ask why? You know, so this is kind of the why questions. Um, does one organization have more of a pattern than another? You know, what are the structures in place? And that's where we start taking this feedback uh, loop worldview, where we can say, like, what are the causes and getting back to our systems what are all of the interactions at play and the hope is that if we can start diagramming the structures these interactions then um, then hopefully we can find uh, leverage points so uh, the author used this term leverage a couple of times does anybody pick up what what do you mean by leverage in this sort of sense like when we talk about leverage in mechanics it's like uh, you know if I've got a lever then I might be able to put a little bit of force in and yet I'll be able to lift a really large boulder. So if that table's there, the table's that's too heavy for me to lift, but if I put a fulcrum here and a board um, and I set it up just right, then, um, then I'll be able to push down with a little bit of force here and lift the table, even though I'm not able to lift it on my own. So what do we mean by leverage in this sense? Yeah. Yeah, so small action leads to large change in behavior. And so the thought here is that if we are event oriented, if we just respond to every event, or if we force someone to just cope with the pattern of events that's there, that's a lot of effort. Um, that's a lot of effort for us to manage every event. That's a lot of effort for the person to 
prepare, protect themselves from this pattern. But if we diagram out the system and see what the causes are, and then maybe we can go in and break some of these interactions or create new interactions that reduce the frequency of this pattern of these events. And so maybe by taking a small action from a systems perspective, we can end up having a much bigger downstream uh, change in behavior as opposed to just responding to every single change in behavior. So that's the idea of finding a leverage point is that we're looking for um, places where we can intervene efficiently and have a lot of impact as opposed to just um, you know, intervening every time that you know, a particular negative event happens and have those events keep happening forever. So that's it, we're looking for leverage. So we might figure out that in a particular institution, um, there are other things that we can do. So rather than at the instant of the negative event, um, be it you know, like uh, maybe student grades are lower or something like that, or, or yeah, maybe students are coming to class and those sorts of things. Like there might be particular events we could come up with and we find out that, um, well, you know, rather than penalizing students for coming to class late, uh, maybe we don't, you know, distribute their classrooms all over a giant campus, you know, that sort of thing. And so that kind of gets to a more systemic reason that, oh, the reason why they're late so much is because of this other thing that doesn't even seem related initially to classes. But when we start diagramming all the reasons why a student might be late to class, then we start seeing that there are other things that, um, that are contributing to the pattern that if we act there, we can actually make a bigger impact than trying to penalize every single student every time they're late to class or something like that. So that's the idea um, in going from events to patterns, to systemic structures. That's tricky because we, so we see the events, that's the tip of the iceberg that we can see. We never see the systemic structures. How many of you have taken like a biology course or learned about the Krebs cycle, things like that, or like, or photosynthesis or, you know, Calvin cycle, things like that. So, you know, these metabolic cycles, those are systems, but they're tricky because um, you draw them out as, you know, there's a certain concentration of, of one component and there's a, and, and if there's enough of it and another component, then there's a certain concentration of another, certain concentration of another, uh, and so on and so on. And, um, and, you know, things happen along those lines, but at any instant, you can only measure the concentrations of these individuals. So it's, it's always weird to me when we do things like draw out cycles because we kind of give the impression, I mean, because they are all going on at the same time, but but we give the impression that like photosynthesis, it, like you can actually see somehow this conveyor belt. And there's no conveyor belt there. It's just when there happens to be more of a particular reactant, there tends to be um, later on more of another reactant and then later on more of another reactant and so on and so forth. And if we look over time, we start seeing how they relate to each other, but it takes us um, sampling the system to look for these events and then cataloging all these patterns and then putting all that together to finally get the cycle. And the cycle is never something we can directly observe. The system itself is abstract, is not observable. And that's what makes systems thinking so tricky is that we, um, we don't even know if we have the right system when we're starting diagramming like natural systems. And that's why we have to come up with a hypothesis for how the system works. And then we can say, well, if this is how the system works, then if I remove all the C's, then I should never see a D. And I can go and do that experiment in the lab. And if it turns out that D's still pop up, even though I remove every C, then I know that there's other links in this system that I've left out. So, um, so that's what they mean by events are observable and systems are not. So any questions or comments about that? I guess I'll write that down here is that, uh, you know, just so we events are observable. Systems are not directly observable.
I mean, it's similar that if an alien came to the planet and all they found were a bunch of cars and didn't see anybody driving around in them, they wouldn't know what the cars were for. Uh, but the car would still be a system. If they then said, I think they're for transportation. I think that if you put your key here and you turn it this way and you push your foot on the gas, then it'll move you around. They could do that experiment and they could then see the system evolve. And then that test, aha, yes, these are for transportation, or at least that's one thing they can do. But that's another thing I guess I also want to put here is that systems have or can have multiple purposes. So if we think about a car, it's transportation, sure, but it's also shelter. If you think about rain or even heat, um, in some people's cases, it's entertainment. So, uh, you know, you can sit in the car and maybe watch a movie if it's an electric vehicle. And that's now a common thing. People sit there and watch movies in the car while their vehicle is charging. Um, it's a storage system as well. So it's a storage device you can put stuff in the trunk. Uh, you know, you know, where did I leave that thing? Oh, I left it in the car. Um, so you can have multiple functions. And so, um, and so this is a big reason why um, I like to use the word function instead of, of um, purpose. For one, purpose sounds weird to me with natural systems. Like what's the purpose of a tree? It sounds a little creepy. But, um, but functions, that, that sort of suggests that something that's a little more agnostic. And it's, it's easier for me to picture multiple functions. Um, and um, it's harder for me to say multiple purposes. Okay. All right, any uh, questions or comments about that? All right, good. So if we're on board with the idea that we need to look beyond event and look for interdependencies, causal relationships, then we say, well, how do we communicate that and work with that? And that's uh, the introduction of these things we're gonna see throughout the rest of the semester, a causal loop diagrams. or CLDs. And uh, before we get into the definitions here, I wanna emphasize that um, the loop is um, from the ability to find loops in systems. So in other words, a CLD does not need to have any loops, despite having loop in the name. So we call it a causal loop diagram, not because we definitely are sure there's loops there, it's because we're taking a loop perspective where we're interested in loops, we're interested in feedbacks, and so a CLD helps us catalog all of these causal relationships and let us see if any loops pop up. So it's like a causal diagram for finding loops. And we just you know, uh, shorten it to causal loop diagram or CLD. And um, so a CLD, like I said, is something that looks like, like this. So I can say um, hunger, um, would be one uh, variable in an example CLD, and I'll say food ingested would be another. And these are two variables, I'll call them. And I draw links representing the causal relationships. And so in here, I say that when I am hungry, um, I, if I increase my hunger, I will increase my food ingested. And so um, I am going to put 
a, a label on this where I will say S um, or plus, where S stands for same. And the idea here is I'm saying if my hunger increases, my food ingested will do the same thing. It'll move in the same direction. So this basically means moves in the same Gesundheit. Now, once I eat food, then my hunger will eventually move in the opposite direction. So if I increase my amount of food, my hunger will eventually decrease. And so I can put an O here or minus. And um, so I'll say or plus for same. And the O means opposite. And just different authors use S versus plus and different authors use O versus minus. Um, you just have to be familiar with both. Um, and, uh, and so that again is just meaning that if you increase the food ingested, eventually the hunger will decrease. And so there's an opposite relationship there. Now, I said that eventually. And so, um, and so I'm gonna add one more symbol here. And this is a symbol for delay. And sometimes people just write the word delay. So when there are, there are always delays. Causation implies delays. It's impossible for something to be caused by another thing and then to happen at the, inst the same instant of time. So whenever one thing causes another thing, there's going to be a small amount of delay. Now, if all of the delays in the system are roughly the same, then we don't really need to call one out as being special. But like in this system, um, I know that, uh, that my hunger regulation mechanism is probably going to say, when I get hungry, I'm going to eat pretty quickly. So this delay is much smaller than this delay. But I also know that the fact that I won't realize that my hunger is satiated on, um, you know, as I'm eating, is going to give me a, a, a high chance of overeating. And so that's why this delay is important for me to include uh, because, it, because the fact that it is so much bigger than this delay is going to cause this system to act very differently. So if this were, if this were like immediate, there was no delay there, then I would ingest food, exactly the amount of food I would need to, uh, to reduce my hunger. But um, because there's a delay there, I will overeat and, um, and then I'll end up needing, having more food and that can you know, create other sorts of issues. So, um, so that's, you know, we need to add those delays in there to indicate that this is something that is, it takes longer than kind of the rest of the system. So you could put delays on every link, but it ceases to be useful. So you just have to put them on the links that are particularly um, strong delays relative to the other. So any questions about that, about these notations so far? Yeah. Yeah, in this case, so causal loop diagrams are about the behavior over time. So it's like this idea that um, if I ingest food at some instant, how much longer will it be until my hunger changes? So it's a the delay in time relative to when the change happened here. Other questions? Okay, so, so this is what I mean. Uh, I'm gonna refer to when you draw causal loop diagrams as link labeling. So whenever you draw a causal loop diagram, I'm gonna expect that you label all your links. Now, if there isn't an obvious uh, causal direction, then sometimes you have to ask yourself, have I created fine enough variables? And so um, it might be that I, um, that the, you know, that there's, 
like here, it's pretty clear that hunger has a positive relation to food ingested. But if, um, but if there's this a nonlinear relationship between hunger and food ingested, so at some hunger levels you eat more food, at other hunger levels you eat other food. Um, sometimes you have to specify that you know that I am not referring to general hunger. I'm referring to extreme hunger, where the relationship is always. Uh, the same, uh, you know, so sometimes you have to be a little bit more precise, or you might need to add more variables so that you account for both conditions inside your diagram. And we'll see more examples of these sorts of things as we see these diagrams kind of drawn out. Um, but, um, but that's that, you know, you want to try to make sure that your links, that they only have value if they have these labels on top of them. Yeah. There is, but we're saying it's negligible. So th there would be, but I would say that um, what I'm emphasizing here is that this delay is maybe longer than this delay. So the, yeah, so it'd be like, I'm hungry, I'm in my house, I can go right downstairs and I can eat. But I'm probably gonna eat more than I need to because of this delay. Yeah. I'd say the more important one. So it's kind of like I'm making a stance here that in this system, the only thing I need to worry about is hunger and food ingested. I don't know how I'm also making a stance that this is the only delay that's worth noting. So you're taking a, uh, an argumentative stance and somebody could say, no, actually um, you're not at home and this delay really matters. And so in order for you to eat, you've got to actually order something from Uber Eats or whatever and in that case, like whatever quantity arrives, that's the quantity and that's it. And you could say under that condition, then I need to put the delay there. Yeah. I would say any links that are particularly large relative to the other. So if there's like 50 links, but two of them take a really long time, then those are the ones that you would put the delays on. Yeah, so it's not just one link, but it's any that are, that where the delay really is a part of the identity of the causation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, this is what we call a dynamic hypothesis. So the formation of a hypothesis is always subjective. It's an educated guess. And then in order for us to they could say, well, if this is what's operating, then we could make certain predictions. And my predictions might be that, well, if I, um, if I let, if I never ingest food, then the hunger will never go away and we could test them. Um, or we could say, if you ingest food faster, the hunger will go away faster or something like that. And we could test that. So uh, we initially draw these as hypotheses. Um, a hypothesis that's been well tested becomes a theory and we can then take it for granted. So, um, so the causal diagrams can represent both things. I guess I could put that up here is that a hypothesis or a, a yeah, hypothesis is an answer to be tested, whereas a theory is an answer that is taken for granted because it's already been tested a whole lot. So I bring that up because like, we pretty much think that this is how hunger is regulated. This is a theory of hunger regulation. I can just assert that, but now I can build new things on top of it. So let's say I'm gonna add socioeconomic things like you know, food desert modeling and things like that. I might have this as a part, a subsystem, and then draw a larger causal loop diagram, which will affect the access to food ingested and that will be a hypothesis about how the food desert affects people's ability to regulate their hunger. And so, um, so yeah, theories are things we take for granted, like this we could probably take for granted, but hypotheses are subjective. They are proposals for how we think the system operates that we then can test. Okay, question. Yeah, I would say that is that um, uh, include if 
significant relative to system. Uh huh. Well, I mean, so that's a good question. Like, if this delay was as big as this delay, um, yeah, if they're, if they're both big, um, they're actually, and this is, so it's getting, this is a little bit more nuanced here, but um, what I would say is how significant a delay is, is kind of relative to the speed of the system. And so um, it, 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 there actually is an argument that you might have to put two delays in here and show both of them if they're both really slow. Because if you think about it, like if I ingest food and it takes a day for me to notice that my hunger has gone down, um, regardless of how long this delay is, that's still gonna really affect this control loop. If it takes another day for my hunger to cause me to ingest the food, like, so it's, it really has to do with what we refer to as the time constant in the system. And so this is getting a little bit, this is actually kind of getting into like SOS 212 territory, but certain system, when systems are naturally fast, where most of the other uh, action in the system kind of doesn't, or changes at a fast rate, then anything that's lagging behind the system um, is, is important to put out here. So like, what I guess I would say is that this subsystem does is embedded in a larger system where these delays probably matter. So although I've drawn this simple subsystem here, it's not so much how this delay relates to this delay, but it's more how these delays relate to the bigger picture question that we're asking. And so if the bigger picture question that we're asking evolves um, changes dynamically on the order of seconds, and these delays are on the order of day, then we probably need to put them both in there to say to my stakeholder, um, if you're planning on hunger regulation to be regulated in anything less than a day, I can't help you. And I'm going to indicate that here by putting both of these delays there. It's a little hand wavy, but does that kind of make a little bit of sense? It's When we're drawing these simple systems, it's hard for me to sort of make these rules that um, that make total sense. But when you draw the bigger systems, then it becomes very clear that, um, that it's not how each link relates to each other, but it's how each link relates to the big picture as a whole. And again, it's a stance. You're saying, is it important for me to actually go out and measure this delay? That's really the big thing here is, um, it, if you draw a delay there, you're telling an empiricist that in order for you to understand the system, you need to go out and measure this and find out exactly what it is. Here you're saying, eh, it's negligible. You don't have to measure it. We just assume it's instantaneous um, and it's not going to affect our answers. Here you're saying, depending on how big this delay is, is going to affect how we analyze this system. That's what you're saying when you draw those lines. Okay, any other questions about delays? And hopefully the link clarities are clear. Okay, all right, so um, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna talk about the two types of loops, the balancing loop and the reinforcing loop. Um, but before I get there, I wanna also make sure that we introduce behavior over time, BOT, graphs, which some people shorten the BOTG. So you can see both of those things in the literature. And these go kind of hand in hand with thinking about these systems. Um, and so, a behavior or time graph has got time on this axis. And in this class, we're not going to be in, you know, using math or computation to, to solve for these. We're going to be sketching out kind of cartoon behavior over time graph, qualitative understandings of you know, what things uh, might uh, happen. Um, but, uh, in, uh, but you know, in things in like 
SOS 212, you actually learn how to put into a computer specifications for these systems and hit play. And then it will then simulate the systems and generate these behavior over time graphs. But that's something that we don't do in this. So that's, if, for those of you who've seen stock and flow diagrams, if you can draw a stock and flow diagram of a system, you now have enough information that you can actually have a computer generate one of these for you. So if I consider, um, let's just say a different um, system here, uh, temperature control system. So we've got a, a desired temperature and we've got a actual temperature in a house. We've got some gap between them. And then we've got um, furnace heat. So we're thinking about a winter situation here. And so if I wanna make this into a causal loop diagram, I could say that, well, if, um, if there is, and by the way, gap here, um, I will define um, as desired minus actual. What I mean by gap. All right, so the idea here is if the actual temperature in the house increases, what's going to happen to the gap? So it gets warmer in the house. Um, uh, so is the gap going to get bigger or smaller? Assuming the house was cold and it gets warmer. So, and I guess if I want to, maybe this will actually help with the behavior of time. I'm also going to draw a little dash. So this is um, my desired temperature. So this is what I'm saying here is that um, for all time, I have one desired temperature. Let's call it 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And, um, and then I've got my actual temperature is down here. And it's, it starts out cold. And let's say it starts out at, I don't know, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, then the gap between these two is 10 degrees. And so if my furnace is working, then it should cause my temperature to rise. And so as the actual temperature increases, what happens to the gap between desired and actual? It gets smaller, right? So it decreases. Everybody see that? So as the, um, so I'm going to put a little, I'll use minus, um, or you could say, or O right there. So as the actual temperature increases, the gap is going to decrease. And then my behavior over time plot over here, that's shown here because we start out with a 10 degree gap. But as the actual temperature increases, it becomes a seven degree gap, and then a five degree gap, and so on. So you already see that, that as actual increases, gap decreases. Okay, good, good. Um, and then we could say, well, what would happen if you went over to the thermostat and you increased the desired temperature? Well, if I increase the desired temperature, what immediately happens to the gap? Does it increase or decrease? What was that? Sorry. How many people say increase? How many people say decrease? All right, good. Everybody says increase. Yeah, that's what I would say too. If you took this desired temperature at 70 and you moved it up, it would cause this gap to get bigger. So I draw that desired temperature to gap with a plus sign or S. So we don't normally write all these ors. I'm just putting them in there so that we know that some people are going to do pluses, some people are going to do s's. Depending on my mood, I might do one or the other. Some students have an easier time with same and different, uh, or same and opposite. Other students have an easier time with plus or minus. Um, all right, so um, so that's how these two things interact with the gap. This gap is actually a physical quantity measured inside the thermostat. And the thermostat will respond to this gap by changing the furnace heat. So if the gap is large, or if the gap gets larger, the furnace is going to want to put more heat into the house. 
So if the gap gets larger, the furnace is going to want to um, increase the heat. So this is uh, a same relationship. So everybody see that? If the gap gets bigger, the furnace heat gets more. So a bigger gap is more heat. And then as you get more heat, then uh, more heat into the house means a little bit later, depending on the heat capacity of the house, how much air is in the house and things like that, eventually the temperature of the house will go up. So as um, the temperature goes up, and I'll say this is or S, uh, we'll also get a plus relationship here. Does everybody see those relationships? We got between heat and temperature is plus, between temperature and gap is minus, between gap and furnace heat is plus, between temperature and gap is a desired temperature and gap is plus. Well, that makes sense. Okay, all right, I drew all that just to motivate um, this behavior over time graph. Um, and this behavior, and, by the, and all of these notes, by the way, anything I write in class, I will put up on Canvas, a couple of, uh, you know, and feel free to take pictures and things like that, it's fine. But just letting you know that, you know, hopefully the recording's going right now and these, uh, this PDF I will share. All right, so, um, and so this behavior over time graph is going to explain the pattern of events, I guess you could say, that's generated by this system. And so I can imagine that over time, this temperature is going to go up and maybe it'll hit the desired temperature and it'll just be flat. And that's maybe what we would ideally want. But let's just imagine that instead, that as I turn the furnace heat up, it takes a while for the actual temperature to change. Uh, but everything else is pretty much instantaneous. Well, in that case, the actual, um, the, there's this delay there is may create a situation where if things rise about the same, but you end up getting what we refer to here as ringing behavior. And so what's happening there is that um, the, the furnace registers the old gap and it dumps heat, but there's not an immediate change in this gap. So it keeps dumping a lot of heat into the house. Now, eventually a little bit later, the temperature finally does start catching up and reducing the gap. But at that point, you've dumped too much heat into the house and what's happened, the temperature has overshot the desired temperature and the furnace has to turn off. And, but maybe when the furnace turns off, um, maybe actually there's an additional delay in, the, the, the how, um, in how quickly the temperature is measured by the, the gap here. So because the thermostat's upstairs and you're downstairs, it doesn't sense the same temperature as you. And so you can end up getting this ringing behavior where you need to get these overshoots where it has to get really cold for the furnace to turn on, but then it turns on for too long. And eventually this thing, what we call it damps out. So this is uh, damps out. It doesn't dampen out. It doesn't get wetter, it damps out. And, um, and then that, uh, and then this, that ring that generates this ringing phenomenon, and that's you know something that delay. This is a delay effect, as shown in a BOTG. All right, so um, I want to stop there and give you the attendance exercise, um, but we'll pick up for this on Tuesday, and I'm going to go through all the rules for how you choose these variables, and then how you label these loops. This is a balancing loop, and we'll figure out why it's a balancing loop on Tuesday. Um, so don't forget, Muddy's Point um, is, uh, is Sunday, and I think I had one other reminder. I forget what that was, though. Oh, the reading for Thursday. All right, so how the attendance stuff works is, so I put something up here on the screen. Um, you, if you don't want to do this electronically, you can also just give me a sheet of paper 
but I'm going to ask you a quick question and you can go to this QR code uh, or you can go to this URL. Um, you will, uh, if it says you don't have access, you need to go to uh, Google Drive and, um, and log in with your ASU account. And after you do that and then access this, it should link. Um, and so um, what I'm gonna do uh, is ask you one question and you can put it in at the top of the form and just hit submit. Other times I'll show this several times during the period and you'll just add them up and at the end of class we'll hit submit. So the question I have today here is, um, is a car a system or a collection? So in the answer to question one, just write system or collection, whichever one you think it is. I don't grade these for correctness, I grade these for coherence. So as long as your answer makes sense um, for my question, then I'll give you the attendance point. Is that clear? Just only one question today, yeah. I wanna, don't wanna keep you guys any later. And I look at the timestamps, but if you're having trouble logging in, you know the question, um, and I'll give you like another half hour or something like that. All right, thanks. Have a good weekend.